Atletika Barcelona Gaden. All of you that uh, uh, are here in this design hub uh, building in Barcelona, and those of you that are looking at us through the uh, Arts Electronica website. So as you know, this is a special edition of Arts Electronica, a uh, networked event uh, with almost 120 cities around the globe. Uh, mm, in connection with this network of gardens, no, so we are glad and we are really happy and honoured to be part one of to be one of those uh, of gardens in, here in Barcelona, where with several institutions we have managed to do this um, uh, this uh, Barcelona garden that is like someone said is like a park right now because it, it has grown uh, with so many uh, round tables and also with uh, the exhibition and uh, the audiovisual capsules, the taxis. Visit the studios that you may be able, you are able to, to look through the Arts Electronica website and also to the, through the Ramon Llull Institute website. So you will be able to check out all, this, all the contents. And as you know, this is also a live stream uh, through the Arts Electronica website. So um, welcome to all of you to this special session. As uh, you may have uh, noticed, this Arts Electronica Garden here in Barcelona, we have focused, we decided to focus on two of the main uh, keywords of this Arts Electronica, which are uh, uncertainty and ecology. We do think that both of them are connected and are also connected with this global uh, health situation, global pandemic, that affects us not just uh, through this health crisis, but also <clears throat> through the economic and social and also political and, of course, ecological crisis that are ongoing. So, in this context, we wanted to address um, these two keywords highly connected. And in this uh, particular session, we wanted to reflect on uh, what does it mean to uh, live in the context of this uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty has been a word that almost uh, has appeared almost recently, almost everywhere. No? We talk about uh, how to manage this uncertainty, how to deal with uncertainty. And this is something that um, uh, from uh, either from uh, the economic economic side than uh, the social side, the uh, uh, psychological side of, of it, of uncertainty, how to deal, how to manage uncertainty. These are some, some of the common words that we are, uh, common uh, expressions that we are dealing right now. No? So we wanted to address that. What does that mean? What does uncertainty mean through the art and uh, science, technology, um, and also the thought uh, that could give us insight about this, uh, this word, uncertainty. So, uh, the title of this, uh, of this session is Facing Uncertainty and Its Discontents. And um, uh, we wanted to, to address uh, how to, uh, some questions that were, um, were the main ones, that, the, the first ones that we, we, we think about when we, we, we need uh, some, some, some thought about it. No? That, for example, um, uh, how to take the risk of uncertainty and try to slide the games, no? But of course, what, how arts and science, technologies and thought have learned from it and propelled their practices of uncertainty. What's the role of uncertainty in the arts practice and also in, the, in our lives and also in our societies, no? And how to deal with that and how, to, how, does, how that has, um, uh, has uh, been one of the key uh, words that right now we are all struggling to, to, to deal with, uh, no? So in this panel, we will explore these different approaches to this topic uh, in the global context of an imperfect predictability of facts, some may say. Uh, so um, this, uh, this session is, conduct is, uh, is conducted by me. I'm Paul Alcina. I'm, I'm, 
I am director of the Arts and Technology program here in the, at the Open University of Catalonia and one of the uh, curators of, the, uh, of this whole Barcelona garden. And uh, uh, together with, uh, with me, this uh, Roc Pares, uh, um, Tere Badia, uh, Joan Soler Adillon, and Marina Garcés. So right now what I'm going to do is like uh, do uh, briefly uh, present each one of the, uh, of, the, of the participants and after that I'm gonna ask them some questions and I'm gonna do it one by one so after all the round is done then we will, uh, we will be able to, to talk and a little bit and to, to try to, uh, to reflect on what we are, uh, when we are in, in here, no? the reason why we're here and also then we will open questions to, to all of you uh, to those that are in here and those that are on, on the website <coughs> and YouTube channel, some of them would, uh, may, may, may want to ask some questions. So if you are go listening to, to this uh, live stream session, please go ahead and uh, post your questions in there in the, in the, in the channel. No? So we will be, uh, we will, uh, we will, there's a micro over there and uh, our colleagues will, uh, will try to, um, to put your, your voice over there, no? so you, you will be able to have your answer back, no? so your answer back. No? So, <clears throat> uh, briefly, I would say that uh, thank you <clears throat> for, uh, for, for all the As Electronica. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure since now. This is the second day, and uh, right now we, we, we wanted to, 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 to uh, after the, the second day, the first day was mainly focused on uh, ecology, uncertainty was there also, but this day uh, we start at this hour with this uncertainty uh, uh, panel with Roque Perez. Roque Perez is an inter interactive communication artist and researcher. Uh, he also has a piece uh, exhibited at the Santa Monica um, uh, Center uh, that also in some way deals with this uncertainty and this uncertainty regarding the fact of how we construct our vision, our binocular vision. So maybe you might, might want to, to put some points uh, and address that issue in your in your talk, no? And um, uh, Paris work is characterized by the poetic and critical experimentation. That's something that you have been doing for many years with digital technologies. And your work has been presented in and exhibited in festivals, art centers, and museums all around in very lot, many different places. He's a um, uh, he a professor and researcher in communication department at the Pompeo Fabra University, and uh, you, your work has been published in many journals and also uh, uh, editorials. No? And you have also launched um, some platforms in electronic art. You, you are like, you've been like a pioneer here in the, uh, the context of Catalonia with projects like the Galeria Virtual many years ago. That was really uh, stunning for all of us. It was really interesting. The, dedicated to the development of virtual realities and art form. That was many years ago. Or uh, the Magmine Linear, MAL, or many other projects. No? You've been director of the Masters in Digital Arts uh, for many years. That mo Most of us, we, we really uh, learn from that. I mean, <laughs> almost uh, there was a whole generation of the, uh, digital artists that uh, were really grateful for, for this master that was really inspiration for all of us. And also, you are also really con convinced with this uh, interdisciplinary culture um, uh, and this work in between art, science, technology, and society. No? So uh, uh, please, uh, I would like to, to ask you about how you deal with uncertainty in your work, because this is uh, something that you have been uh, dealing as a, as a positive co construction in, your, in, your, in the way your, your, your work uh, uh, um, uh, st established these this connections between disciplines and between different ways of dealing with uh, the, the, even the, the historical past and, and all the different uh, knowledge. So go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much, Pau. Thank you for your kind presentation and welcome everybody to this panel. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that as a visual artist, probably being speaking to an audience is not what I really prefer doing, but also during my 30 years of art career, I have been teaching for more than 25 years together with my research, being able to uh, reflect and uh, speak about some of the aspects of uh, visual creation in our time is part of my job too, so I will try to do it in English as properly as I can. Um, I thought that I would base my intervention um, mainly centered on a distinction 
between two different economies, the economy of creation on one side and the economy of speculation. And uh, for sure, my choice is the economy of creation, the creation of experience, the creation of knowledge. And uh, this is why I should say from the beginning that my experimental artwork, my art practice, is understood by myself and some of my colleagues as a practice-based research or an art research, which is a form of generation of knowledge. And for me, this is important, and this is why I chose also to uh, put this video in the background. Probably people who are watching us from the internet are already thinking that their connection is slow or something similar. This is a um, probably like a sabotage for a session like this, which is live streaming. But this video uh, is one piece that I have been doing uh, since 2004 in several different uh, contexts, trying to adapt to each context, but always uh, related to having a smartphone, turning on a video streaming application in my smartphone, and having a gathering where people uh, have maybe some sandwiches and some drinks while we fill balloons, like party balloons, with helium. And then when we have a big bunch of balloons filled with helium, we tie the smartphone to the balloons and we let it go uh, erratically, flying away from us who knows where. And maybe this is why in his introduction, Pau said that I embrace uncertainty, since many times when we see artworks presented in galleries and museums, or maybe we hear about art experiences uh, through art history lessons, we think that the artist is a control freak who is always looking after the smallest details in the composition, in the color, in the rhythm, in whatever are the specific properties of his production. But in my case, and uh, through the years, I have many times chosen to give some uncertainty as a specific property which uh, uh, solves some of the problems of composition, like as you can see here, where the bunch of balloons are taking the uh, video streaming smartphone uh, through the city of Rome, um, you see how uh, there is moments in which the image stops and freezes because I am using uh, an infrastructure, which is the uh, cellular uh, coverage network, uh, which is unstable. Uh, I am using it in a very non-conventional way since uh, the, co the coverage area of the, uh, of the cellular network works very well uh, from zero to 20 meters, but not higher than that. I am using also some weather or climate factors as the winds in order to uh, pan uh, or to tilt the camera in its composition. Um, of course, there is the traffic of cars, vehicles, of people that appear on these videos who are not actors in the sense of dramatic acting, which is plans uh, through a script which is written previously. Uh, as you can see, there are many aspects of my work which uh, embrace, as I said, this idea of, uh, of uh, uncertainty and which um, I think that not only in my work, but in several art practices of the 21st century, which uh, draw from practices such as situationism or fluxus, um, there is this fascination for some kind of serendipity or for some kind of uh, chance or uh, randomness included in the creation process. So when I listen to radio and TV or uh, when I r read the newspapers nowadays and I see that uh, behind the health situation that we are living with this pandemic, 
uh, most of the people who write from an economical perspective uh, in, in our time are um, afraid of this situation taking us to uh, some uncertainty in the terms of economic unpredictab unpredictability. Um, I, I usually think that, well, the problem is basically that uh, capitalist economy is probably based on this um, uh, assumption that the system is organized uh, in a possible growth that is uh, unlimited. And uh, of course, this is a fiction which is uh, uh, completely wrong in many ways, but as we know, and as it was also commented here in the panels yesterday, um, this idea that unlimited growth uh, is uh, what is killing the biodiversity or what is killing uh, the possibility of having uh, like a, a fair society or, or a fair trade in the sense of the social interactions that are arranged in this capitalist uh, economy are based in this uh, faith, blind faith, I would say, in uh, the unlimited grow, growth. While the work of artists have uh, developed different strategies in which uh, there is no blind faith in this particular growth uh, of the wealth um, depending on, on the maintenance of the, of the situation, on the, com on the conservation of the conditions of the economy, but uh, almost all, it's, it's completely opposite. What I am trying to say is that for uh, many artists, at least in my generation, some of us who are understanding our work or our electronic artwork as a, an exploration of the non-conventional uses of technologies and understanding these technologies of technologies of the as technologies of the self rather than technologies that create worlds we are seeing how these technologies are reconfiguring ourselves we think that uh, through our work Maybe I don't like the, the word to inspire, but maybe at least we can give, give a testimony to the rest of the society that um, there are several aspects of uncertainty, of randomness, of uh, lack of control or loss of control, which uh, would probably be good antidotes for some of the problems of our global economy. And in this sense, when you see an action or an experimental uh, telematic action like Dariva, which is the title of this work, and Dariva in this case is the Dariva on Rome that started at Centrale Montemartini, which is the building where we are landing now. And we'll see some people who are like gathered are around and they even improvise like a countdown waiting for something like so for this strange flying point of view to arrive to them. What we will see in some minutes is this crowd of people because what I have been doing since I started doing this art performance with the helium uh, filled balloons and the smartphone is reversing the video document that resulted from the uh, erratic camera flying. And when I reverse it, I always know that the video will finish in the moment when we launch, launch the balloon. So this is like, I know that uh, Juan is also interested in time uh, as an important factor of art creation. And uh, I think that this reverse reverse of time where you can see now the people who were gather, w gathered around me where, when I launched this smartphone with the bal balloons are finally the people who will uh, be the ends of this video and the ends of this uh, telematic performance which somehow I wanted to share with you today. So this is the end of my intervention as well. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot. 
Uh, thanks a lot for your for your track out. You this is images that get you. We are uh, as you look at them, uh, you get a little bit dizzy. So right now it's perfect. We got the feeling of <laughs> what it means, what it means, what you were talking about. So right now we are uh, we, we we move on to Tere Tere Badia Tere Badia. Uh, right now uh, she is secretary uh, general of the Culture Action Europe, an organization in Europe that deals with. Uh, with this all this network of artists in uh, throughout Europe, and she's uh, dedicated to cultural research and production in various formats. She has carried out several studies and cultural policies networks, st studies on cultural policies networks, and R plus D plus I for visual arts. Uh, Terry has created exhibitions and projects of contemporary art. She has been professionally linked to InterArts Observatory in the 19th and another communication agency in Karlsruhe many years ago also. Terry coordinated the platform Dissonancias in Catalonia for the promotion of the relation between artists and research departments and companies, an organization that was a really interesting uh, project, as well as the network of visual arts production spaces of Catalonia, Charcha Prod, some of you may know, and until two years ago, uh, Tere was director of Angar, the Center of <coughs> Artistic Production and Research in Barcelona, which is one of the main part partners of this Arts Electronica uh, Barcelona Garden. No? So you have been dealing all your life with these in-between mm. uh, disciplines, in-between strategies, between the professional and the academic, between the in-between worlds, between the, the disciplinary and between uh, many, many, uh, many projects. So um, I guess you have learned something about that. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to share with us a little bit of your uh, insights on, on that and mm. your uh, in relation with this also in uncertainty world we are all mm -hmm. facing. Yeah, so yes. thank, thank you very much, Pao, and thank all the organizers of this um, conference. So finally, we have Arts Electronica in Barcelona. I think it's a good chance. <laughs> we have been traveling to Arts Electronica since, well, a long time. So to have it here, I think it's, uh, yeah, it's a very, very nice opportunity to bring the, the festival here. So um, I'm going to um, more or less uh, read my notes because I tend to chaos and I tend to <laughs> uncertainty and to not to lose myself in the narrative I'm gonna I'm gonna read uh, the, the notes that I that I have here so um, yeah so my approach to the topics on art science technology um, in in this case in this uh, round table we will focus on the devices that we have given ourselves to deal exactly with this uncertainty in the intersection of art, science, and technology. <clears throat> the devices for me are three, mainly disciplines, institutions, and the interface in between all of them. So let's start with something that I think it's pretty obvious for those working in the middle of, of um, arts, arts, science, and technology triangle. Uh, yes, I think it is clear for all of us at this point that disciplinary research is not able to withstand with the complexity and that cannot be solved within a system of isolated areas of knowledge. In a context where a high degree of complexity and uncertainty happens, a disassembly of disciplines and disciplinary borders are required. To address complexity and uncertainty requires interdisciplinary approach. Of course. Also, it requires to create the possibility of a context uh, where the contamination of dis disciplinary paradigms takes place. It requires to put on the table interrogatory approaches that are not previously formulated by inherited methodologies or inherited knowledges. But nonetheless, this can be almost impossible. Because as we know, uh, knowledge is conditioned by the disciplinary backbone of who investigates. Uh, to address complexity requires also to be able, to be able to question the integrity of disciplines through recognizing the influence of other agencies, other agencies that are not made purely by knowledge, but by, but by other forces, energies, and material conditions, both internal and external, that very often escape from the knowledge domain and for the certainty that the knowledge is looking for, uh, but and interfere in it, including so bringing in more uncertainty. 
Thus, exploring and addressing the uncertainty and complexity around ours requires A, in disciplinary and collective research, collective research is important here, requires and common context, collective knowledge exploration, radical experimental forms, disciplinary and institutional dissent, and must take in account these layers of the influence of other agencies. This is very clear for most of the projects and institutions that have been working with uh, arts, art, science and technology in this intersection. But with this uh, situation now, this uh, COVID crisis, but not only the COVID crisis, but the, 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 the evolution of the, of the system, uh, what this has evidence is that, on, uh, that this is almost a perfect narrative, but this is built upon diverse structural rifts, cracks, that affects the way both disciplines and their institutions operate towards uncertainty. I will try to open now those of those, the, uh, two of those structural things that I think that are important. First, uh, the wide scope of and the strength of the disciplines and the disciplinary legitimacy. The triangle of arts, art, science and technology is built partially upon the interface between disciplines involved and its institutions. But it could be that this interface is an obsolete device and it's not anymore capable of bypassing the self-referential paradigms and cannot subvert the legitimacies as at stake. Disciplines and institutions were created almost together. Uh, on one side, and, and it's not me talking, it's of course, Foucault, it's disciplines characterized, classified, specialized, are distributed on a scale around the norm, rank individuals among themselves, and disqualify and invalidate this also. On the other side, the institutions, the resulting device to achieve these goals, institutions are primarily intended to bring order, to reduce uncertainty, and to shelter certainty. Its passion is to create practices, models, routines uh, cap capable of defining standards. In other words, to shelter, to shape normality. And whatever the nat nature of the institution, it performs constantly, constituting its durability. In the middle of the 20th century, new norms of knowledge uh, production appears, whereas uh, traditional research was heavily uh, based on disciplines built to justify the autonomy of the science. This new approach was context-driven, problem-solving, and essentially interdisciplinary and heterogeneous. The change of perspective naturally fa facilitated the approach of the various disciplines and the dialogue and the change of methodologies smoothing the appearance of new synergies between different areas. A good example of this is exactly this Ars Electronica festival, which started in 1979, which and it was born focused on the interlinks between art, science, uh, art technology and society. But one of the factors that most promoted the interdisciplinary approach was precisely this problem-solving approach which was pertinent in the solution of specific problems of each of the disciplines. However, the main problem of this approach is precisely the resolutive domain. Problem solving aspires to tackle any complex situation, starting from clearly defined problems and working towards finding definit definitive solutions. By its own logic, problem solving tends to simplify and speed up the technical meeting of the solution. It's self-referential, and it works and evolves towards its own goal, ensuring the centrality of a good result. And this is precisely where one of my doubts arises uh, when speaking about the intersection between art, science, and technology. The question is whether an approach of this nature helps to solve issues such as true mutual recognition, and therefore of the legitimation of the discipline voices when formulating knowledge. This clearly affects the handling of uncertainty in this crossroad. What for some is a doubt to clear, a problem to be solved, for others is an engine for, of serendipity. Uh, Rock was giving a perfect example of, of this. All the disciplines in dialogue have developed their own methodologies to resolve the complexity and therefore having a common, they have a common meeting place, which is dealing with uncertainty. However, few are willing to compromise the script of their own standards, since all those standards underpins their legitimacy. But exploring together is maybe also about other things than confronting uh, legitimacies. From a point of view of this mutable and transmutable reality, the future is in permanent change due to certain actions of individual collectives and institutional bodies. 
the drivers of this change do not anticipate the effects of these actions in the future. Again, serendipity. This inter interdependence and the contaminating effects had, that, had, that it has uh, invites us to rethink if interfaces between dif disciplines and between infrastructures, those that we have been building in the past 30 years, are obsolete. Because how open are really these interfaces to uncertainty, to serendipity? I think that not much, really. Those who have tried to work on that interface uh, will know. Then, are these interfaces obsolete? Have they lost their ability, if they ever had it, to really mediate between different disciplines? Are disciplines and institutions capable of not getting caught out of fear of getting lost while going back and forth from other disciplines' domain? And how do they manage the interaction of uncertainty and complex factors? Humans, non-humans body, technologies, domain, knowledge domain, hegemonies, dominances, etc. This crisis, in this crisis, this interface has cracked. And this may be because no matter how we treat them, disciplines and their institutions and also their interfaces are designed not to really overcome self-referential paradigms and cannot subvert themselves to, or to go exploring together on equal leg legitimacy. They are built upon themselves, again, not to embody intersection and interdependence. To radically open the interfaces among disciplines, therefore, could mean to open and disobey. And I'm taking this sentence from this concept from Joanna Moy and Sanjara Jara Rocha. To open and disobey the terms and conditions of the own institutional apparatus, and of course, the own discipline. To dismantle its standards and performativity in order to let the possible, the real possible happen, the uncertain happen. It means to start a process of reverse engineering and let these micro gestures of the interdependence perform. The second and second part of the concept that I think the second thing that, that, that I think that it's important to, to, to talk about is the fact that while we know that explorative research is a collective effort, we do not always embed the collective condition in, in institutions and in disciplines. In other words, in the triangle of arts, uh, art, science and technology and beyond bringing together methodologies, goals and tools, we need a serious reflection on how the collective political agency is appealed and what is the real scope of this agency. We already stated that to explore is a collective, to explore uncertainty in interdisciplinary domains is a collective action. And a collective action has, in my view, latent um, lat um, abilities that are too often disdained by disciplines, by institutions and by interfaces. These capabilities are, first, one of them, the condition of the collective, which depends on who and what is considered legitimated, worth, or able to be part of this collective. And second, the agency of the collective itself. If it, if it can act political, politically on the apparatus and its interdependencies. When reflecting on this collective condition, a collective action, we should take in consideration the intersectional perspective from which we to analyze privilege, power, material conditions, but also the standards that we are creating, science, art, or technology. As we know, everything and everyone is affected and traversed by a system that reproduces extractions, exclusions, canons, dominations, and this, the latency of this bias is a, cru it's a crucial one and it is very often completely ignored. In the places where discipline intersects, who counts as a nation to be part of the collective? Can we order it? order the collective through representatives of those entities we invite to be part of the collective, someone from the arts, science, from the technology, from society, to which extent is the individual and collective agency performance in the intersection, in the discipline, in the institution, in the interface? Who are we leaving aside when we do that exercise of tokenism, of inclusion without influence, of symbolic signings, as Lucia Egaña beautiful writes? And how do we operate towards those, this um, misheard voices of those that are occupying space and a site of normality and legitimacy, and those that auto-institute themselves as interdisciplinary and dissent agent. How could we count on them without establishing an inside and outside, and thus again establishing a sort of inclusive illusion without agency? To conclude, 
Explorative devices are those that can be discerned, dismantled, redesigned, and claimed by the collectives to question its possibilities, either on a concept conceptual level or in terms of their operating tools and associated technologies. They should be able to overcome predefined standards that constitute hegemonies and trigger displacements of disciplines, institutions and interfaces, without hindering the political articulation of the collective involved. Soft and uncertain devices that safeguards dissidents, devices thought in terms of con contingency of events, inter interdependences and actions that performs beyond the transcendence of the, result, of the, uh, of the results, and uh, devices that are open to the action of this tropism of dissent that uh, was named by not by Flores. So nothing else from my side at this point. Thank you okay. for hearing. Thank you, thank you. That was very interesting because you came from from others, from chaos to other, and mm -hmm. from uh, from the epistemological to the infrastructural, and also the the, the 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 social and the political, of course, that is involved into mm -hmm. this. Uh, uh, explorative devices that you were you were posing. It it really comes into uh, um, well. It really connects with what Joan is going to talk after after you in some way. I guess that that um, uh, where uh, you have been dealing also with this uh, cows from other, let's say, yeah. <laughs> to the emergent uh, properties. That's something that you've been exploring through all your your work in, in as many years uh, from for many years, no? And it also connect with the work of of, uh, of of rock also in some way that the image the image itself of this uh, this session where we announced that it was some, uh, uh, it was a, a result of the mixture of between both of you uh, some some artistic intervention that you did all together with different uh, approaches to uh, to this uh, uncertainty uh, issue. No, so John Sole Adillon is an artist and associate professor at the um, uh, Open University of Catalonia, the Universidad Alberta de Catalonia. Um, his research uh, practice uh, revolves around digital interactive uh, media and its manifestation in digital art, particularly interactive installation. That's something you've been doing for from, from some years now. Interactive storytelling and documentary, and also virtual reality, something that you've been working lately and you do have a piece right now moving on through different space. Maybe you might you may show a little bit yeah. of, of, around that. That would be great. No? From a full body interactive uh, game uh, uh, run on an inflatable slide. No, uh, some project that uh, really was really uh, interesting to see. To a VR based experimental documentary. This is something that you have done. He has participated in a myriad of projects with a focus on both uh, behavioral design and interactivity, and on fostering the audience collaboration and participation. No? So, so uh, you uh, you have uh, um, been uh, working with different technologies and also with different uh, ideas, back background ideas that come. Some of them from the science, technology, and also from the philosophy. That's mm -hmm. something you have been working also to. And uh, uh, this this uh, idea of the emergence, uh, so some that comes is, comes really uh, uh, as something that you've been uh, struggling for many years, and uh, maybe you might. Uh, uh, sh share with, with us a little bit of your insights into these uh, these questions and your, through your work also that this is mm. the one that you have been sh uh, you are showing right now in here. So go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Pau, and thank you the organization for the invitation in this event and in particular in this panel. So uh, after being invited and briefed about this talk, I started to look back at how my own art practice and research are dealt had dealt with uncertainty, no pun intended here. And I realized that while I readily use the concept explicitly, it actually had. As an artist, if one thing, I've been dealing with interactive systems, with systems, but particularly interactive systems, and it, within it, with the search for, or at least the, work, the, the will to work with the imperfect uh, predictability that you mentioned 
uh, this has always been there. So I thought that my contribution to the discussion could be this, to talk about systems very briefly uh, with huge conceptual leaps because we have the time that we have and to illust illustrate this with some of my work and al along the lines of what Rock said, hopefully some of these ideas can shed a bit of light, not on how to solve or really how to face, but how to deal with or at least how to be in a system like ours that's facing um, uncertainty. Um, so when we think about uncertainty as individuals, uh, I was going to say maybe we're lost, I think Marina may, may be talking a little bit about that, but let's say that we have a certain set of tools. When we think, um, when we think of it from the point of view of systems, we have others. Now, systems can be many different things, and as I said, I, I won't go into detail uh, with this now, but let's think of only two types of systems. We have the mechanical system, the one that comes from the Industrial Revolution, revolution the clockwork machine, which is predict fixable mostly, and if not, it's replaceable. And it's linear mostly in the sense that um, what it does, it, it, it's incremental in a linear way. There's no play, not much place or they shouldn't be placed for uncertainty on it. At least it's not modeled for it, it's not designed. And then we have the complex systems, in, in, um, the bio biological systems, the climate, um, some social systems which are less predictable um, or prone to unpredictability. Mo many of them are non-linear, or at least they have non-linear uh, elements in, in them, and they have these threshold points that, uh, in which the linear linearity is broken, the, the non points of no return and things like that, which I think um, our current situation is very illustrative of how we as a society respond to these kind of things. And climate change is something that is in the back of our minds and we know we're not responding it well. And so if, if we look at how we've responded to the current crisis, to think about how we'll be there, with, let's, let's not get into this, but it's not a nice picture. Um, there's entropy that are not fixable um, in some points or in, in some ways. And obviously, society is a complex system. Economic, economy is a complex system, politics, etc. And they also have certain characteristics that are interesting. They also um, more prone to change. They, they face uncertainty in a different way. They can be resilient, they can evolve, and they can show emergent characteristics. And I, I'll go back to this, uh, I guess, in a, in a moment. So why, why, why am I bringing this up? Because obviously we are in a situation where our system or our systems have been sever sever severely disturbed. Um, and many of, of our systems have, and art, of course, is not an exception. And as a parenthesis, um, when we think about the disruption in art, many of us think about concerts and big events, but there are also other forms, especially in digital art, that uh, are very much under threat, like uh, installations like the ones that you see there, VR, you know, how long until we feel comfortable again, passing on a headset. Um, and this is something in my work I'm really struggling with right now. But even looking back at, at some of my own work the, recently, I realized how really impossible some of it would be right now. Uh, the foot on the uh, below, by the way, is by rock. Um, you know, projects where people have to hold hands to connect things, huge interfaces, huge shared interfaces. All of this is now um, impossible to do or, or to implement. Um, but what I wanted to really talk about uh, is this idea of how I've been dealing with uncertainty, with unpredictability in my work. My entry point to digital art a few years ago was basically interactive installation. And when I started working with interactive systems, I was looking at interactive installation, things that we do, uh, how the system responds, etc. And I quickly became quite frustrated with the linearity of it. And I'm not meaning, I don't mean uh, narrative linearity, but system response response linearity. So you do something, the system does one thing, and you, do the, and you go away, someone else comes back, and the system does the same thing again. What I use the term the on-off problem to talk about this. Of course, this is not always a problem, but I wanted to see uh, how to deal with these things, and I came up with the idea of complex interactions uh, to, to think about this for myself. Again, it's something, uh, I, I wasn't inventing it. In the 50s already, the British cyberneticians had been doing um, 
predictable systems and art works like this one. Uh, the, the one on the top is um, the Colloquy of Mobiles by Gordon Pask, 1968, uh, a predecessor of A-Life, uh, an interactive installation, a fantastic work that, by the way, has been replicated two years ago by his disciple, Paul Pangaro. And on the back, there are some work uh, done by Dresden and Verstappen on from the cellular automata systems. So there are systems that respond, there are predictable, and there are systems that behave, like the one on top. And I was interested in, in, in that, and in the aesthetics of behavior, to borrow a concept from, from Simon Penny. Um, and it, which relates a lot with the chance and randomness that Drock was mentioning earlier. And I have handwritten notes. I don't have a printer currently. So, um, this complex interaction thing, uh, I started, the, the first step was to work with randomness, and I created, the, this is our liquid video, which is the one I used to modify Rock's image that we use for the panel. It, it, it was originally a live video feed, distorted, then slightly reorganized it in real time using randomness, and basically it's reading pixels from one place and placing it in, a, in another, and this disfiguring and reconfiguring a little bit the, the image. But that, that was okay, but it was not what I wanted to do. It's actually not, in, not really interactive. Um, the next step was to... to um, I ended up using um, genetic algorithms. At, th at that time, I didn't know it, but I was creating a live art. Um, and I, w I used genetic algorithms, which is a, a technique that simulates evol evolution, which um, originally was intended for classifying systems or for efficiency, but many artists have used it to create unexpected results uh, and things that deviate from the, the control freak, you know, that, that, that can create. And my intention was to try and get, get these things to, to create um, even new ways to interact with the user. So this, this is Digital Babylon. Uh, it simulated an evolving ecosystem and introducing these evolutionary mechanisms both within the system and how these things relate to each other. So it was very interesting with this to do experiments in which I would let this run overnight and see how it was behaving in the morning and things like that. And then also in regards to the uh, interaction with the user and or visitor. And this led into my research as an academic, which incidentally affected my uh, production as an artist, but this is for a whole other topic. Um, and I ended up working or um, researching a lot the concept of emergence that came out of this. And, and, and I think it's, it's one concept that's very interesting to reflect on um, um, in a situations like the one we're living. Of course, there's, again, many ways to look at emergence. Um, my take on emergence is that actually it relates to two different concepts. One is self-organization, which relates to how uh, interactions and what at one level, local interactions at one level affect uh, a, a, um, a higher level in a systemic point of view without intending to do so. And then the idea of emergence relative to a model, which is uh, a way to understand how something new appears either in a system or in regards to a system or maybe a new behavior or a new thing. Um, if you go deep into the concept, it's all about how the system has been modeled and how philosophically a model is a model. So it, 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 it can't really get everything, but it's it's a very interesting to, to concept, uh, a very inter interesting concept to work with. Um, so this was my let's say my work. Are we good on time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this was my work with uncertainty in the form of what I was doing, and then I started to deal with uncertainty in a way. In my I guess in my the last works. Uh, in the content and some of the discontent, I guess, uh, with it. And, and this is in pieces. This is an experimental documentary on the personal, personal impact of political prison. Um, and I used uh, terms like post-democracy, dystopian present to frame it. It's a VR installation that uh, talks about the Catalan political pris prisoners and their uh, immediate relatives. And it, I think it relates to the, what, what I was saying about the complex system because it uh, explores a moment of change, a moment of a sudden loss of human rights, a moment in, in which your system falls apart and you di discover that it wasn't what you 
wanted to believe it was, at least. Um, and of course, it, it deals with the discontent, with my discontent as an artist and what I wanted to transmit with it. But also, I think it's the first. It's one of the first words where I, I shift something I had one. Um, we, I wanted to do for a long time, which is um, that people were not necessarily. Uh, happy or were not content after looking at the piece, which digital art all quite usually is something, it's nice, it's cool, it's, it's fun, and I wanted to, it to have a little bit more of punch. Um, and then finally, my, uh, this is my current work in progress with my colleagues Bettina Katja Lange and Uwe Wurner, Wurner um, which takes a step up directly at least from politics and it will depend very much on, pe on the people contributing to it, how much political it gets, I hope it does a little bit at least. And it's, this is a collaborative piece in which we explore intimate spaces. As you can guess, yes, it, it was March when we were starting to work, well, about, uh, work with this project and then we all became locked in at, at home and then we decided to, do, to document this and to to ask people to record the spaces, uh, think about them, and start to work with comp composing them and, and do a VR work that, that works with it. So both these two last words uh, address uncertainty. They're, they, they're, they are tales of a moment of uncertainty. By, and the, what they have in common is that, that both resort to the fragments, the pieces, a strategy ba based on micro-narratives. Micro Every, everything is unfinished. Everything is broken, and, and we try to piece it together, and we give the audience a lot of room for the imagination to a lot of they need to bring in a lot and I think this is this is something that's quite interesting um, with with this from several points of view one is that uh, again it's uncertain um, a, a little bit it tries to tap into the poetics of, of all of this leave room for whatever is brought by the by the, pers by, by the viewers. And since we're, on, we're, we're here and this is open to collaboration, I, was, I just wanted to let you know, um, look it up or uh, look for the smallest of walls and consider why not uh, collaborating in it. Um, and this is my intervention. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Joanne. Well, um, in your presentation, you, you, you showed some of your work that really connects with this idea of uncertainty and how to deal with that through the emergence and or just to as a, as a theme, uh, but also as a, as, a, as a form, let's say, as a content, as a, as a form, no? let's say, to deal with uh, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, using d several technologies, but also concepts from from science and from from uh, philosophy itself, no, and uh, it connects with some of the talks that previously we have uh, done, and also, and um, I think it might connect also with with Marina. Marina Garces is our last speaker. Um, uh, she's associate professor. She's a, a philosopher and a, and a writer, also very, pretty well known in here. In, and it's a uh, 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 associate professor at the, at the Arts and Humanities Studies at the uh, Open Uni uh, University of Alberta, Catalonia, Open University of Catalonia. And her work is mainly concerned with political, with politics, with critical thought, and the need to build up uh, a philosophical voice that is able to interpolate and commit. Uh, she is author of the books. So some books that um, many of us have read and have learned a lot from, from that. Uh, uh, in the prisons of the possible, that really um, was long time, long time ago. That was really interesting. It connects with some of the things that has, has been, have been said here. And also, Un Mundo Común, a Common World, or very recently, uh, well, not that much, that's just so many years ago, uh, Philosophia in a Cabal in Finnish uh, philosophy, and also uh, 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 well, of, well, many other books like Ciudad Princess and another one. She has also written for many uh, periodical and collective publications, such as Humanities in Action, that was really a nice one, with, uh, uh, was struggling with some of the things that you said, also with his disciplinary boundaries and all the whole thing. No? Um, and uh, since many years, you have been uh, the one of the founders and also coordinator of the project Spine Blanc, which was a group initiative uh, in favor of committed practical and experimental relationship 
with philosophical thought, no? that was really many of us have been uh, dealing with that for uh, in several contexts. No? And uh, uh, well, you, you have like a question about uh, why uncertainty has been one of the key words, no? uh, why we all, we all uh, trying to mm -hmm. manage uncertainty, to uh, deal uncertainty, to face uncertainty, how, what's the role of uncertainty in our society, and how come we have uh, this question right now has been um, in, the, in the center, and, and um, some of them as a positive uh, approach, and all other ones as, a, as, a, as something to, uh, to control and to, 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 to manage in some way. No? So please let us, <laughs> some of your thought about that, please. Thank you, uh, Pau, and thank you to the organization, the different institutions that have collaborated in the organization of this discussion and this event. Um, it's my first talk after six months of <laughs> confination, summer break, being alone or being with this kind of privatized uh, spaces uh, of life. So I was looking uh, at the people arriving, uh, people that are uh, uh, looking uh, to us through the screen cannot see them, but it was nice to see how the distance was organizing this kind of dance of the people just looking for a seat, not so close to another person, people moving for a very long uh, minutes when we were starting because it is difficult to be together. <laughs> Uh, in this way, but I am happy also to be uh, with people for the first time, uh, taking uh, our time and, and the space to be uh, uh, together, even if it is uh, difficult and not easy. So I wanted to, to say it because we are taking for granted that our lives is, is going to, to continue through screens, through emails, through Zooms, through this kind of uh, things and through protocols of uh, guarding distances. And I think it's uh, a thing that has to do uh, with what we are trying to talk now, is giving uh, a sense of um, security to what we feel that is risky, menacing, and uh, not easy uh, to live in the present and in the future uh, times. When we try from many different kinds of discourse to give, uh, to find an, a, a way to to name, to, to, to explain, to say something about these times, about these difficulties and these times, uh, it is very easy and very immediate to use the, the, world, the, the word uncertain, uncertainty, you, how you were saying it in, the, in your introduction, politicians, uh, artists, scientists, educators, uh, and we all as uh, people, we say this is uncertain, school is going to be begin, it is uncertain if it is going to continue, everything is uncertain. I would like to put the question um, that why is it so obvious that our times are uncertain or that uncertainty is the clue word or the main word or the key word to define our times and what we are living. How has this uh, obvious use of uh, uncertainty or uncertain as, an, uh, no, as, a, as a characteristic get to, um, to be so, um, so uh, easy to use in our discourse uh, when we talk about our times? Um, so I, what my question is going, my aim is to put uh, uh, some light of suspicion on the use of this term of how easy it is to use it and its consequences and on the way we are facing our, our times. If we go to a dictionary, for example, we are trying to speak this Catalan English that we are sharing today. I, I went directly to the Cambridge Dictionary to, to, not to make uh, errors in, uh, in translation. Uncertainty names just, uh, and I quote, a situation in which something is not known. Seems easy definition, very clear. Names uh, defines a situation in which something is not known. So 
um, uncertainty perhaps is not just a correct, an objective characteristic of that situation, but is mainly pointing at our not knowing something about that situation whatsoever. We can, all the situations that are uncertain to us. So uncertainty is, a, is like a, a simulation of objective description of the world, of reality, of situations, but in fact what is pointing at is our not knowing, our ignorance, our um, decisions, our uh, doubts, our uh, shadows, our fragilities, our uncertainties, but as, as a subjective uh, point of view, as a position in relation to what is going on, what we have to decide, what we have to organize, what we have to represent, no matter, no matter what. So uncertainty is a fact of, is not a fact of the objective world, is not a fact of reality. We cannot take uncertainty for granted. It's not something that is there but is an effect of perception that has to do with knowledge, knowledge not only in a epistemological sense, knowledge in a very pragmatic and, and, and common sense uh, of um, experience, that in some way affects, sorry, is the timing, <laughs> um, that in some way affects our capacity of decision-making, action, practice, intervention. So it's a, is a perception that links something, something that has to do with knowledge. What do, do we know about what uh, uh, is going on in a, in a certain situation? And our capacity of moving, deciding, interventing, acting in relation uh, to it. So uncertainty is something we are saying about us, projecting a description or an image or a, or, a, or a representation of what is going on outside of us. So uncertainty talks about positions we take in relation to our world or our, our world or our common uh, worlds. But what uncertainty makes when we use it at, as a, just as a, an objective description of reality is neutralizing this position, uh, like um, uh, projecting a shadow on this position and just stating, uh, 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 describing that uncertainty is out there. What happens if we change perspective and we let this sense, this feeling, this perception of uncertainty interrogate about us? Why, how, um, there are there things that we don't know uh, enough what are the reasons for impotence or incapacity or insecurity or fear in relation to certain presents, futures or, um, or horizons? What are the reasons or what are the consequences for our fragilities? Uh, in, in what extent this privatization of life, this individualization of decisions and perceptions make, makes us more fragile and more insecure and more um, uncertain about what we can uh, do, think and express um, with others. Uh, what happens if instead of stating all the time that times are uncertain, that our realities are uncer uncertain, we start to make and share and develop all these kind of questions? And one that is the more important, the most important to me, how many strategies of opacity, institutional opacity, corporative opacity, epistemological opacity, educational opacity, are, interact are, are, are effective, no? are, are inter interacting in this mediation between our perception and the situations we uh, intervene, we are in. I think we are in a world where the simulation of transparency is a, a huge shadow on the real opacity that's, that is operating all the time, that is mediating uh, constantly uh, in the experience we make of the world, the world in this pragmatic sense, not as a, as a totality. And uncertainty 
as, a, as an hegemonic or is becoming this kind of hegemonic discourse is contributing to this kind of opacity. If everything is uncertain, we can just continue in this kind of position of mm, just reacting to what we don't know, reacting to, to what we do not know how to do, and just leave things happen and react to them uh, immediately. We have to interrogate the forms of ignorance of our times, we have to interrogate the forms of fragility of our times and live with them in a more, uh, uh, in a more, uh, with more dignity and not with uh, uh, such uh, and frightening fear. And we have to critically interrogate the forms of opacity, among them this, this, this menace, this constant menace of uncertainty that is um, limiting, neutralizing our position as individuals, as collectives and as societies in the situations we, we go uh, through. Why is it so useful? Why is it so easy? Why is it so um, at hand, not at, so, so um, repetitive to, um, to appeal, to recall uncertainty, and to, re and to reduce any question as how to uh, adapt to it, how to respond to it? I've said it in a very... Uh, um, uh, general way, but I want to point out some reasons. The first one, I said it uh, before, talking about uncertainty seems to make objective, it doesn't make it, but it seems to make objective what is a subjective condition. As we said before, times are uncertain. If we state that, we make objective what is a subjective position. So it reinforces this sense of uncertainty and makes us uh, just um, subjects that respond to it. Second, it creates, it creates a narrative linear fiction about a stable, uh, secure past and an unknown, unknown frightful uh, future. It's very clear nowadays, also with the experience of the pandemics and its consequences. We are all the time uh, um, in this uh, projection of we are entering into more and more uncertain uh, times. Uh, this linear culture that we have in, 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 no, in mind projects a completely fictional sense of the past as something that, or as a time, that was more secure, more uh, stable, more um, mm, yeah, more secure, more stable, more 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 predictable than our present and our future. And if we think about facts and not perceptions, it's very easy to <laughs> deny this the, and to dismantle this uh, linear fiction about the past and the future. Of course, we can think about wars, about uh, starving, about many things, but for example, as a woman, just thinking about what meant not so uh, decades ago and in many other parts of the world, uh, give birth to a child, no? that's what women uh, do um, uh, in their lives as a predictable and expected um, uh, service to the community has always been a very risky, very uncertain and very uh, dangerous act. How many women have died giving birth to their child? So when someone is saying, or we as a culture are saying, oh, past times were more stable, more secure, more predictable, more uh, linear, and now we are entering into a risky, fragile, uh, and uncertain times, what are we saying? What are we talking about? What, what are we really saying about, uh, about our um, practical and real experience of our lives, our worlds, and our uh, social relations. I've given this, this example, but we can talk about many, many, many uh, facts that uh, really um, 
do not suit to, to this kind of, um, of of narrative that the 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 the, the, present, the, the way we are talking about uncertainty nowadays uh, pretends. Third. Uh, if um, uncertainty in discourse builds this uh, narrative and linear this um, um, uh, fiction about past and future, it also presents um, or represents our present or gives uh, us the possibility to live our present as something that can only be understood, managed, uh, faced, as something to be evaluated in terms of risk. It has, is a long uh, issue in sociology, etc. this risk uh, society, but it is now um, something that is present in all corporation, institutional, and always, in, and also in our ways of, of understanding life. Living, making decisions, programming, uh, whatsoever in an institution, in a corporation, is evaluating risks. That's the main reason for everything. No, that's what, what gives reason to what we decide, not decide. So when knowledge and its, its, no, and, and its maps are cancelled uh, under uncertainty, we cannot know. Um, what we are facing, we cannot manage only some data about what we are deciding. Any action is taking a risk or reducing a risk or making a bigger a risk. So pr the present is um, something that is in hands of this kind of uh, risk evaluation, in hands uh, of the experts of this kind of um, evaluation system, we can see it all the time, economists uh, model um, this kind of you know, prediction models, prognostic um, action, um, uh, excels as a tool for this kind of uh, living our times. So is that model that, that constructs a perception that needs the mediation of experts that can tell us uh, in a different levels and, and, and ways of, of understanding it, what are the risks of our action in any moment, at any time, and for every level of our lives. We could talk also about medicine, about so uh, uh, everything. Also, education is going into this discourse in a very clear way, and I think it's another issue, but it can be, it, it must uh, be taken very, very seriously. And finally, as a, cons as, a, as a consequence of all that, and in the fourth point I wanted to, to state, um, I said it before, the consequence on this subject that in fact is talking about its not knowing what to do, what to say, what to think about what is going on, under this uh, hegemonic uh, discourse on uncertainty is put in a position that, uh, that in, in I call um, adaptive servitude. That means a, a regime of servitude, a, a, a system of, of domination, where um, the, um, the best action, the best response uh, for the subject, for the student, for the citizen, for the client, not whatsoever we are, the best response is always that one that adapts better to a changing uh, situation. For example, nowadays in pedagogy, this is the main uh, objective uh, to, um, to transmit, to, to, to train, because it's not a transmission, it's a training uh, towards students. Train them to respond uh, efficiently, that means in in adequation, no? Adapt, in adaptative, in, a, in an efficient adaptative way to changing situations. It's obvious uh, no? about our times, that's the way to, to survive, no? and, and, and not only to survive, to have a, chan a chance to survive with success possibilities. So it's a, it's a game, no? it's a game in, a, in, a, in the most serious uh, way is not a regime uh, sustained on blind obedience anymore, in a, 
in some parts it is, because layers of, of power uh, are accumulative and not exclusive, but is, uh, is not only based on blind obedience, but on smart response, is responses. Now we are um, trained to be capable of smart responsibles, adaptive responses to these changing and certain conditions of life. So, um, it is a, no, a kind of intelligence of incertitude what we uh, must develop as servants of this regime of uh, domination. So, uh, it's a very, very uh, quick argument, but I just wanted to, to point out very seriously that um, uncertainty is not an obvious fact. We cannot take uncertainty for granted. It's not something, a, char a characteristic of our world that is just there. It talks about our perceptions of our position in relation to what is going on, and it constructs a very narrow uh, space for our action, thinking, and position uh, in, 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 in the situations, the social, uh, personal, and political situations, situations we, go, we go through. So critical thinking, I think that must take seriously and not just uh, um, use a critically this term, because it's not neutral at all. It, it is part of a construction of, a, of this regime of adaptive servitude, and I think that we need ways to um, recall uh, all the questions that um, uh, get neutralized by it about our forms of ignorance, our ways of, um, of deciding of our fragilities, and all, um, above all, this Mm, these are structures of opacity that project a shadow that um, doesn't allow us to face, to cross, and to share the situations we go through. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Marina, for your, your, your thoughts on, on that. Uh, and begins, begins the point of uh, <clears throat> uncertainty as the black box that we need to unveil, something that is waiting to be certain. So in this waiting to be certain hides some ways these uh, opacities that you were, you, were, you, were, you were talking about. No? So in some way, uh, uh, all those different uh, uh, presentations were connected uh, in, with different concepts uh, of, of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of uncertainty, but now we have uh, still time for some questions. So I guess that it, let's move to the questions and see if there are some questions in the audience. Uh, audience. Some of you might want to ask a question. We still have uh, room for uh, some questions. Let me, or if not, through the YouTube channel, some of them. Or we might want then to ask, uh, to talk a little bit between us about uh, what we have said, no? So, in some ways, uh, mm, Tere was saying some, something uh, related with this, uh, with these uh, the structures and the the, the, collides, the collide between the structures and between and within the, um, uh, the, the epistemological uh, fundings and the way it's, it's being structured through these through these uh, institutions. No? But also, you were also Marina uh, talking about the, the 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 discourses that are hidden between some of the words mm -hmm. that we take for granted, and then we don't see that uh, we get into the trap. No, mm -hmm. like yesterday we used we we also uh, got into these uh, these traps when we mm -hmm. we started uh, thinking about the utopia as also as a trap or and the, the positive uh, discourse a trap or so many big words that are there mm -hmm. and then you don't realize and then you use it as a for granted and then you get into uh, a, a way of thinking that doesn't mm, allows you to do well I'm in prison <laughs> I want to get out this this world because it doesn't help me for that no so maybe you would like to 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 do some reflection about uh, how this um, uh, these words also structures uh, 
these hidden uh, worlds that are in those, those black boxes are uh, structuring uh, uh, inf institutions, but also uh, as, as education itself, uh, but also as, a, as, um, as the, uh, the art world in some ways, and also many other uh, pr uh, spaces where these uh, things happen. Uh, or some of you might want to, to reflect a little bit on that and connect with, with that, or Rob, you might. Well, I, I was just uh, trying to process all the inputs that mm -hmm. we just get, and it's uh, interesting to, to see that in this idea of uncertainty, as Marina said, there is this perception factor, which is not probably a quality of uh, reality, but a quality of the, of the mindset that is put in front of any fact. But I would like to say that uh, taking that into account, the mindset of many artists is probably already wearing these uncertainty uh, filters, which uh, tends to maybe even exaggerate some of the unknown aspects. And that is completely the opposite of what the mainstream does, in which there is an over-exaggeration of what is certain or about what we know, as if it made reality something reliable, in which you can bet and win and generate that growth that we were talking about. So I would really go for uncertainty as a revolutionary potential in, a way, in the way that it breaks the loss of this uh, speculative economy that is behind most of what we do. And taking the context in which we are speaking, when I think about cultural institutions or the institutional, institutionalization of culture, and I think about my first visits to Ars Electronica in the year that the building of the Ars Electronica Center was open to the public, the feeling was that there was somehow an institutionalization of the electronic art, which I always interpret, interpreted as some kind of counter cult culture. And at that moment, I thought that we were maybe falling into some institutionalization. And the lemma of the Ars Electronica Center was the museum of the future. And all that narrative of technology brought into our homes, in our work spaces, made like the impression of a happy world uh, that was going to be a better world with technology. And I think that only 25 years later, we see that that museum of the future is uh, very far away from the, uh, it doesn't reflect what we are living today. So yes, I think uncertainty has won against the institutionalization of art and culture. So mm -hmm. I really go for it. I would make my own t-shirt about <laughs> Probably we had some, uh, there are some questions were there? Yeah? Yeah, Irma, Irma Vila has a question. Uh, YouTube, through YouTube, okay. <laughs> Hi, Pau Walder asks, isn't the fear if uncertainty fueled by a system that wants us to be confident consumers? Wow. Uh, that's what's exactly what we were yeah. saying now, no? Yeah. We, they want us to be confident consumers, thinking that there is something predictable and that we know what's going to happen, but at the end, it's because the marketing, the publicity is making us feel this illusion of certainty, which is, uh, um, but, but it's a mirage. Yeah. I, I'm not so sure about that because I think it's, it's a combination of prediction on, condi on conditions of unpredictability. And that's what uh, experts can be, mm, mm, experts of any kind uh, have as a, as a product. Mm -hmm. Give you, uh, or give you, or give us as consumers, citizens, etc., a margin of 
predictability, letting you ex feel that everything is uncertain. That's, for me, it's the new product mm. of the system. It, it, it is not anymore a, a system based on stability, inst institutional, linear, um, eternal uh, truths. Mm. And uh, one, one of the cl another clue word of our times is disruption. Everything mm. must be disruptive to be something. Mm. No? Yeah. Uh, and it, is, it comes from the markets, of course, but now also in pedagogy, in institutions, uh, yeah. culture, corporations, anything. Because uh, the system needs, um, it, and that's why it is a system that um, doesn't work anymore in the time of the promise. It promises you nothing um, in terms of anything because time is not um, uh, is no guarantee for nothing, but it makes it work. So it's a combination of fear and uh, price, not, and, and you move in this game of opportunities, or we move in this game of opportunities, knowing that we are always always on the edge of falling out of it. And it works. Uh, so, and it's not 